All right, so let me call up um, our worship team, uh, uh, a team of two this morning. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So why don't we stand this morning? Let's enter in. Um, let's just um, prepare prepare ourselves. I just felt the Lord leading me to read uh, Psalm 23 to us before we start worship. So just uh, you can close your eyes. Just let's prepare our hearts to, to come before the Lord. So the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You prepare the table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So, Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for sending your son, Lord. And we ask that you give us overflowing cups, overflowing cups of gratitude and gladness. Father, we ask for, for an overflowing of your spirit this morning, that we, can, that we can engage and we can partner in in the heavenly worship. In Jesus' name, amen. restores my soul. That's what's been really on my heart, and you're going to see that through the songs today. Um, thank you for that, Colby. That was so good for my soul. Um, so because we are easing back in and we're not uh, singing congregationally this week, I thought that our first song could be a call and response because we can speak. So um, I have Psalm 107, and we're going to have the slides up here, and the words that are bolded, um, I'm going to have you respond by saying the words that are bolded, I'll lead you in that part, and then I'll read the other parts. Um, this psalm is an amalgamation, it, it represents testimonies from innumerable people, um, testimonies of what God has done, how God has been, what, what God has done for people. Um, and what, what has God done for you? Has he redeemed you? Has he bought back your soul and, and given you his life? Ha, um, has he healed you, provided for you, loved you? I, I want to encourage us to look back and see what has God done for me, but not only what has he done for me, but who is he to me? Um, it says that God has made us the fullness of him who fills all in all. And this just is so mind-blowing that he has created us to fill a place in him while he fills us and is the fullness of all in all. So I just want to encourage you to speak out um, and read this psalm together with me. Okay, so we're going to start together. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Tell others he has redeemed you from your enemies. For he has gathered the exiles from many lands, from east and west, from north and south. 
Some wandered in the wilderness, lost and homeless, hungry and thirsty. They nearly died. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble. And he rescued them from their distress. He led them straight to safety, to a city where they could live. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Some sat in darkness and deepest gloom, imprisoned in iron chains of misery. They rebelled against the words of God, scorning the counsel of the Most High. That's why he broke them with hard labor, and they fell, and no one was there to help him. Lord, help! They cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He led them from the darkness and the deepest gloom, and he snapped their chains. Let them praise the Lord for his great love, for the wonderful things he has done for them. For he broke down their prison gates of bronze, he cut apart their bars of iron. Some were fools. They rebelled and suffered for their sins. They couldn't stand the thought of food, and they were knocking on death's door. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them snatching them from the door of death. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and sing joyfully about his glorious acts. Some went off to sea in ships plying the trade routes of the world. They too observed the Lord's power in action, his impressive works on the deepest seas. He spoke and the winds rose, stirring up the waves. Their ships were tossed to the heavens and plunged again to the depths. And the sailors cringed in terror. They reeled and staggered like drunkards and were at their wit's end. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He calmed the storms to a whisper and stilled the waves. What a blessing was that stillness as he brought them safely into harbor. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. Let them exalt him publicly before the congregation and before the leaders of the nation. He changes rivers into deserts and springs of water into dry and thirsty land. He turns the fruitful land into salty wastelands because of the wickedness of those who live there. But he also turns deserts into pools of water and dry land into springs of water. He brings the hungry to settle there and to build their cities. They sow their fields and plant their vineyards and harvest their bumper crops. How he blesses them. They raise large families there with their herds of livestock increase. And when they decrease in number and become impoverished through oppression, trouble, and sorrow, the Lord pours contempt on their princes, causing them to wander in trackless wasteland. But he rescues the poor from trouble 
and increases their families like flocks of sheep. The godly will see these things and be glad, while the wicked are struck silent. Those who are wise will take all this to heart. They will see in our history the faithful love of the Lord. Let's say verse 1 again. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Thank you. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, you have taught. Satan should buffet, though trial should come. Let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my head. my soul it is well it is well with my soul my sin oh the bliss of this glorious thought my sin But in whole is nailed to his cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. It is. It's for you, 
for your coming we wait the sky not the grave is our goal oh trump of the angel oh voice of the lord blessed with my soul it is well it is well with my soul jesus it is well it is well with my soul with my soul it is well, it is well with my soul. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone cornerstone the weak made strong in the savior's love through the storm he is lord lord of all When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Christ alone, cornerstone, Weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone, cornerstone. The weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, 
Lord of all, Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of Um, growing up, I went to a church where our worship services were very different. And uh, as a woman, I uh, was not um, permitted to speak during the worship service. And uh, there were often long silences in the worship service. And let me tell you, my soul sang so loud in those silences. So I just, this song asks your soul to sing aloud and let it. It's not asking your mouth to sing loud, but your soul. So let's praise the Lord with all of our soul. There is a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear praises, he hears faith. There is a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear worship, he hears faith. Awake, my soul, and sing, sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise aloud. Oh, wake my soul and sing. Sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise aloud. There is a sound that changes things. The sound of his people on their knees. Wake up, you slumbering, it's time to worship him. Awake, my soul, and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise aloud. Oh, wake my soul, and sing, sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise aloud. When he moves, when we pray, where stood a wall now stands away, where every promise is amen. And when he moves, make no mistake, the bowels of hell begin to shake. I'll hail the Lord, I'll hail the King. And when he moves, and when we pray, where stood a wall now stands away, where every promise is amen. And when he moves, make no mistake, the bowels of hell begin to shake. I'll hail the Lord, I'll hail the King. Praise aloud, sing his praise 
you respond mm. that your word says that though we don't have words to say mm. the spirit groans mm. and the spirit cries out mm. so father let let this morning be a reminder that when we don't have words to speak, you do. That when we don't know what to say, you do. So, Father, we thank you for all that you are and all that you're doing. In the chaos of our modern world, you haven't gone anywhere. Mm. So this morning, we give you all the honor, all the glory, all the praise. And we say over ourselves, over our families, 
over this church, over this island, over this country, Mm. that you do not change. And you do not fail to move. And you never fail to speak. And your timing is perfect. So, Father, we remind ourselves about that this morning. And we thank you for the breath that you've given us and the strength to get out of bed. As David says, I awoke and you sustained me. So this morning we make our yes more resolute than it was yesterday. And by faith we will make our yes more resolute tomorrow morning than it was this morning. So we say yes to all you're doing here, in us, in this city, this province, this nation, and the world. Yes, and amen. 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 Well, welcome to uh, church in person, I guess. It's old school church, I guess, now, right? Yeah, that's right. Welcome, everybody online. Uh, yeah, like in the old days, that's right. <laughs> I remember back in <laughs> six weeks ago when <laughs> we used to see each other. Welcome online, um, you guys that are tuning in. And just, if you're online, why don't you throw a comment in there that, that something you're thankful for today, uh, something that you can look at, just even in your own house, something you're thankful for, uh, being thankful for the little things. and Because we're thankful for being here together um, and to be able to see one another and to fellowship together. And so what are you thankful for? Uh, this morning, I get the pleasure of welcoming um, our senior pastor, Tracy Linkletter. And she's going to bring the message today. So Tracy, why don't you come up? Yeah. Yes. So Father, I just thank you for all that you've placed upon this woman. Mm. For the depth of wisdom, for the insight, for the understanding, Lord. Just ask that you would anoint her this morning, that your presence would fall, Mm. that your words would be spoken. Everybody out now, put your hand over your heart, okay? And Father, open our hearts Mm. that we might hear you. Hear you through the preaching of your word, but hear you just in those quiet moments, Mm. that you'd deposit something within us today. Mm. So declare openness of heart this morning. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Josh. I'm going to hang on to your mic for a second. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I'm just so thankful that God is always on time. Uh, His time is the best time. And uh, we're just going to walk forward into what he has for us. And so this morning before I get started, I wanted to invite Scott Nash to come up. Um, And we're getting close to the start of Celebrate Recovery. I know it's been delayed by a month, but we're getting closer. Uh, So I wanted Scott just to share a few things while I get my table set up. So (laughs) you go right ahead, Scott. Well, I am a grateful believer in Jesus. I celebrate sobriety from sexual addictions. I struggle with people-pleasing. And my name's Scott. Hey, everyone. You know, it's just great to be here this morning in person. And as I watched the sunrise this morning, I was just reminded of Jesus, the sun, bringing light uh, from darkness. And you know what? So many of us in our lives, uh, we may have come from a background of darkness. And maybe even now we're in the light But there are some dark rooms that we're afraid to go to uh, in our lives. And, you know, that is something that uh, we want to address and celebrate recovery. As Tracy said, we are getting close. March 1st, there's our launch here at SCC, and we're just so excited about that. I just wanted to let you know what's happening with Celebrate Recovery um, in Canada these days. Uh, On the 26th of February... There is an online event called Get Connected Canada, and there's probably going to be at least 1,000 people across Canada participating in that. And I'll let you know that it'll be the most people from Atlantic Canada ever um, to uh, participate in a celebrate recovery event. And then, you know what, Uh, next, uh, not next month, in uh, the mid-May, I I believe it's May 14th, there is a... um, 
a networking event for Atlantic Canada for Celebrate Recovery, and it's going to be taking place in Moncton. It will be the second ever networking event, and it'll be the first time that anyone from PEI will uh, be at that event. And there's a lady that's, uh, she is the rep for New, uh, Newfoundland. Her name is Dolores Mackey, and she's going to be coming. Um, she's actually going to stay in our home for a while, and she will actually be giving her testimony here uh, at SCC, at our CR in, in May. So um, I just want to encourage you, uh, if you still don't really know what Celebrate Recovery is, we are meeting as a leadership team every Tuesday night. And I, I would uh, encourage you, maybe even challenge you, to come out. We're going to be in person this Tuesday. And one of the things that we're going to be talking about is what is a hurt, what is a hang-up, and what are habits? Because that's what we're dealing with in Celebrate Recovery. And so, you know, you might say, you know, it's, I don't know if it's for me. Well, here's my challenge to you. Don't wait till God pushes you. Take a step and let God close the door. And so I just would encourage you to come out. There is a pamphlet out in the, at the registration desk, and it's called, Is Celebrate Recovery for You? And I would just really encourage you to pick one up. There is a bunch of what I would call diagnostic questions in there. And it's like, who needs CR? Uh, who needs Celebrate Recovery? And you might just find out that it's you. Um, you know, we, we can be even healed divinely. We can, you know, we can be healed in our, in our spirits. We can be healed physically. We can have surgery. We can have physical surgery. You know, God can do surgery on our heart. And, and that does bring healing. But you know what? You don't just get healed and life stops there. You get healed and then you have to continue on. And if you don't have somebody in your life, if you don't have a group of people in your life that can come alongside you and, and sort of disciple you and walk with you, then that's what Celebrate Recovery is all about. And I would ask you to pray. Because for some people, their church, their meeting like this isn't on Sunday. They, w they won't come to a Sunday church service. But they will come out to a Celebrate Recovery meeting. And that is their church. And so, you know what? We need people. We need technical people to operate AV equipment. We need musicians and worship leaders. Um, and so I, I just encourage you, please, please, get involved and, and at least pray for us. We need men. I'll, I'll make no mo bones about it. We need men. And as a man, I'll say that, you know what? A lot of men think they've got it all together. And we're fixers. And we don't need anyone else. And, and you know what? A lot of us come from a British heritage where, you know, it's a stiff upper lip and I can do it on my own. I don't need help. But you know what? We do need help. And so I just, uh, that is my plea to you today. And I just thank you. I thank you for the church, for Tracy, her support, and just opening up this church uh, that we can run this Celebrate Recovery program. And we just are so looking forward to what God's going to be doing. Thank you, Scott. Is that enough for a sermon? <laughs> you did great. Uh, that's awesome. Thank you. I'll give that to Colby. There we go. Um, no, you know, it's, we are so pleased to have um, Celebrate Recovery starting here. It's been, uh, when I first got here in 2018, uh, we did a bit of a uh, survey, actually, in the church at that time just to kind of see where people's hearts were. And there was a big, there's a big burden here for um, those walking through habits and hurts. Um, and it's something that we carry in our DNA to be able to reach out and to be a church that is the repair shop <laughs> for people to come in with their stuff to allow God to touch and to heal. And so we're just excited that we can take a step towards this and getting CIR started. And like Scott has shared, um, it's something we can all get involved with, uh, or we can go through. And so I shared in my vision meeting uh, back middle of January now um, that it's very important for leaders to have gone through um, gone through something like CR where you're dealing with your stuff. And like Scott said, it doesn't really ever end. 
<laughs> there's, we need to be with people that can walk with us through our stuff because there's layers and layers. And so uh, I'm just excited for where this is going to go, what God is going to do. And uh, thank you, Scott. And I just want to invite you guys, challenge and invite you. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to step into, and God is in it, and we're looking forward to what he's going to do. Awesome. All right, I'm actually going to sit today just because with our online uh, as well as in person, it just kind of, you know, for online, it provides a bit of a connection if I'm sitting. Uh, it's easier to follow me rather than having to <laughs> follow me walking around. So just for today, I'm going to sit um, and share my message with you this morning. So I'm going to get comfortable just like you guys, <laughs> which is awesome. Uh, and I'm really excited to share um, this morning. We're in... Um, the end of my series that I was talking about, the three ways that Jesus provides for our healing. Um, and this morning, we're talking about giving it time. So I just think that even in our pr- in the prayer room this morning before service, there's just so many things that have confirmed, okay, this is where, this is where God wants us to go. This is where he's taking us. Uh, and we need to, when we think about grace and truth, we need to think about the fact that it's not, the spiritual life is not a quick fix. Jesus is not a quick fix. It's a journey. And so as we dive into the third of these three ingredients, I just want to take us back to the parable um, where this is pulled from and where the basis is for these three ingredients. And again, I just want to share that uh, I've gotten the, uh, the three ingredients. They came through some reading that I did with Henry Cloud and his work on churches that heal. And so I'm just expanding in my own way, but that's where I pulled some of the ideas from. So stories and parables, I, as I shared a few weeks ago, Um, We all love stories. We all love to read uh, about an adventure and a story. And stories are very helpful to help us understand. They're pathways to understanding, and they help us to grasp truth. Um, And so this story is truth that Jesus wanted his disciples to understand. He wanted them to grasp. And he wants us to understand and grasp. And so again, as as you listen to the parable from Luke 13, uh, verses 6 to 9, if you've got your Bibles, you can pull it out. Uh, Luke 13, 6 to 9. See if you can pick out the ingredients in this story. And so a man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. And he went to look for fruit on it, but he didn't find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it, and if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. So that's, in the last verse, the vineyard grower gives us those three ingredients. So the first one is I'm going to dig around. We're going to dig for truth. And so we've talked about that a few weeks ago. Uh, The next ingredient is I'll fertilize it. We're going to apply grace. And then the third ingredient is leave it for one more year. We're going to give it time. And so we're going to talk about that today. So we've been working our way through digging up truth, and applying grace. And we're on this journey to learn and to understand and to experience healing of our identities. And so we need to know, we need to understand who we are as defined by Jesus. Not by somebody else, but by Jesus. Who does Jesus say we are? So truth and grace are the first two important ingredients, and so we've talked about those, but I just want to just quickly review for those of you who may have n- maybe have not caught both messages. So truth and grace, very important, and they're, they're the first two ingredients, and they're like these two tracks, I shared this last week, traveling through the universe, and they're, they're meant to always function together and never apart. And so as we learned last week, they were ripped apart when we rebelled in the very beginning in God's garden. And then God replaced himself with religion, which is all the rules. And you are bad unless you do all these things. And so we've been given truth, though, through the law. We read that in John 1. And the law is good, and it reveals to us truth. Truth on its own, though, does not bring about healing and restoration. We need grace. So Jesus came and he fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the truth. 
and he himself is grace. So we read, in, um, we read that Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but that through him, and he's the ultimate display of grace, we might be saved. So we needed to experience grace. We needed his grace. And as, as humans, we struggle to grasp the concept of grace. We find it very hard to understand God's grace. So it was torn from truth. Grace and truth were torn. And they had to be mended and sewn back together. So through one man, Adam, in the beginning, the tearing happened, right? So the tearing happened. And there was sin that led to death. And then through one man, Jesus, repairing happened. Grace and salvation leading to life. So we are torn away. We have to fall, we have to allow the Father to place us back. And it's only through the connection to Jesus that we have life. So Jesus is the true vine, and we are the branches, and in him we bear fruit. And so that picture of the vine and then the Father placing us in the vine. So as disciples and apprentices of Jesus, we're on this journey of healing. Um, and so I just want to check in online and here. We're on this journey of healing. Are you, are you with me so far? We're good. So online, you can give me a thumbs up here. I'm seeing some thumbs up. <laughs> so last week at the end of my message, um, I asked you a question. I'd asked, how are you? In regards to grace, will you be kind to yourself today? And I'd encourage you to be kind to yourself today. And will you let the Father dig around for truth? And will you allow him to apply grace? So I just wanted to, I just wanted to check in and say, how did it go? <laughs> how did it go last week? And so I just want you to take a moment right now. Because um, as you're learning to be a disciple, an apprentice of Jesus, the Father never wastes a moment. He never allows something to escape an opportunity, an opportunity for healing, restoration, and growth. And he makes every effort to give you life. He takes every opportunity to help you produce and grow fruit. And I was thinking about that. I was thinking about fruit when I was thinking about this. And I was like, well, fruit, it's beautiful and it's tasty. Um, but it also in contains ingredients for life. It contains seeds. So as the father is digging around and applying grace, he's helping us to produce things that bring life. Uh, he's giving us life. So just that picture just kind of grabbed my attention. So I just want to take a moment right now, here in person, and for those of you viewing from home, or even if you're watching this later, and I just want us just to pause for a moment and reflect back on your week. So Moira had us in worship to reflect back over the goodness of God in our lives. And I just want us to take a moment and reflect back just over this week. Was there anything where you were like, why is this happening to me right now? Or I don't understand this. Or maybe you experienced some overwhelming emotions last week. Maybe there were some hard situations. Uh, maybe it was a good week and there was good things that you can look, at, look, look back and reflect on. Or, or maybe there was distractions or things you didn't expect. What was your week like? I just want to just pause for a moment and just, you can close your eyes or just, you know, stare off into space, which I tend to do, <laughs> and just reflect back, what was your week like? What possibly was the father, the gardener, doing? while you were doing the everyday to help you grow? What was happening? So as we reflect, even just bring your week before the Father and ask him, what was your perspective, Lord, on my last week? What were you saying to me or what were you trying to say to me? And maybe some of you already know But as we reflect back and as we bring our week or our day before the Father, this is a part of let's, let's give it time. Let's look at what God is up to. Let's converse with him about what he's doing. So it's, it's the everyday stuff of life that is the classroom. 
It's not here at church in the, on Sunday. We can learn some great things and we can celebrate together. We can worship together. But the classroom is everyday life. And that is where the Father is teaching. And it's that moment with your child when you felt like fill in the blank, but you did or you didn't. Or with your spouse. Or with a boss at work. A coworker. A neighbor at the store. It's making a mistake and not choosing what you wanted to do, but still knowing there's grace and we can try again. So the greater our capacity to connect to the Father and just be before him, the greater you're able to see the choice in the moment the lower our capacity to be with the Father and to recognize he's with us in the moment, the lower our ability and the harder it is to see our choices. So if you remember from last week I'd shared, your healing starts with the recognition that you have a choice. That's where healing starts, is when you know you have a choice. And when we come before the Father, he helps us see those choices. And even when I don't choose what I want to, do I recognize that there's still grace to come back and say, Father, here I am. Here I am. What do you want to say to me? So we don't, we don't give up old patterns. We face them. And with truth and grace and time, over time, we replace them with the help of the Father. We need his help with patterns in our lives so that he can replace them. So time is the practice. It's the practice of being with the Father. So again, I'm going to encourage you for learning purposes to, again, consider yourselves like a plant. (laughs) That just sometimes helps. Um, A plant, just a reminder, a plant cannot fix themselves. It's completely reliant on the gardener, And the same goes for us. We cannot heal ourselves. And so when Scott talked about we need community around us, and no matter where we are in this journey of life, it's because we we do, we can't fix ourselves. We are reliant on him, and we need each other. And so we rely completely on the Father. We need his help. So this, though, is where it can get a little bit confusing. Because then you're thinking, well, what do I do? So are you saying, I can't do anything, I just have to sit here with Jesus? So that can be a confusing question. So like I shared, we still have to do life. We have responsibilities, right? We've got family, we've got, we've got people in our lives, friends, we've got work. So we have to do these things, but we do them with connection to Jesus. That's the practice. How do I do life connected to Jesus living in grace and truth, and walking with the Father. So if you think back to last week when I shared, and even just thinking of the story of Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall, they were doing life with the Father in the garden. And it's really the same idea. We can't see God, but we know him. He resides in us through his Holy Spirit, and so he's with us. And Moira explained it so beautifully this morning that Jesus, there's a space in him for us, and then we reside in him. And so, okay, so I want to dig into this a little bit further. What, what do I do? What's my part? So opposite grace is, anyone? Works. I think it's probably on the screen. Yes. <laughs> opposite grace is works. Is works, but not effort. So as Jesus taught us, we're to strive to enter the narrow gate, Matthew 7, 13. And so the scripture verses on the, on the slide there, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go by, because, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are a few who find it. And that's in the New King James Version. I also love multi- multiple versions, and I like how the message says it, because it just is like, clear. Don't look for shortcuts to God. The market is flooded with surefire, easygoing formulas for a successful life that can be practiced in your spare time 
Don't fall for that stuff. Even though crowds of people do, the way to life to God is vigorous and requires total attention. So it's not just, it's just clear. <laughs> so um, we do need to engage in practices, and some will use the word disciplines, if you will. Um, we must remember, though, that practices or disciplines earn us nothing in the economy of God. The place of practices or disciplines is to place us before God. That is all. So it's not just about doing it. It is what is happening on the inside that matters. And so I just I have a slide with some different practices that many of you would be familiar with. These practices and disciplines like meditation, prayer, fasting, study, living this life simply, solitude, submission, service, confession, worship, Guidance. You've often heard me talk about a spiritual director. Guidance. Celebration. So these, their purpose is just to place us before the Father. They don't earn us anything in the economy of God. They put us before him so we can connect and listen and be with him. And even these actions, these practices, are themselves inspired by the divine grace of God. So I've been reading in Richard Foster's book, The Celebration of Disciplines, and this is a book actually that your elders are going to be going through this year as well. And I'm going to share some things that I'm learning as I'm reading through this that they've just been so confirming um, as to what we're talking about when it comes to time before the Father. So, so God steps into our actions the disciplines, and over time and experience, he produces in us the formation of the heart, the mind, and the soul for which we long. We long for that connection with him. And again, the results are all grace. And that is why the Apostle Paul, oh, sorry, the Apostle Peter, in his letter, he could urge us, and this is in 2 Peter uh, 3, 18, grow in grace, grow in grace, and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you see, our normal way of thinking about grace, which I talked about last week, is unmerited favor. And that is what it is. Yes, grace is certainly unmerited favor, but it's so much more. So simply put, we're not able to grow in unmerited favor because we have unmerited favor, right? And so with the, di with the disciplines, the practices, the form that God's grace takes is interactive relationship. It's being with him and before him. Just again, picture the Garden of Eden, being with God, interacting with him. So God invites us into a variety of spiritual disciplines, and we step into them as best we can. Because remember, it's, it's, I like the word practice. I like when it's called practice because we've got to practice these things. So we step into them as best we can as we're navigating everyday life. So we begin to build them in. So these actions, practices, they take us before God as a living sacrifice. And God, in turn, uses our actions to build within us deeply ingrained patterns of righteousness, of peace, of joy in the Holy Spirit. And you can read that in Romans 14. So these new habits are life-giving, and they replace old habits or patterns that are either sinful or just not bringing life. And in these new habits that are life-giving, they start to build contentment in us and in our hearts. And Richard Foster describes it as this. He says, he says, back and forth, back and forth in interactive relationships so that through time and experience, we are learning to grow in grace. So it's not a quick fix. It takes time. So God is working. He's working to form in us, to conform us, to transform us into the image of Christ. And we've all heard the word sanctification. So when we come to Christ, we are sanctified, but we're also on this journey of sanctification, and that is the, the back and forth with the Father. 
And like I shared, he never wastes a moment. He never allows something to escape being an opportunity, whether we step into it or not, for healing, for restoration, and growth. And he gives every effort, and I just love this whenever I think of this, he gives every effort to give you life takes every opportunity to help you grow, to help you produce fruit. And he invites you. He doesn't demand. He invites you to participate in this process by means of an interactive relationship. Now, Richard also, I love how he says this. He says, now this deep character formation in the subterranean chambers of our hearts So it's deep. It's deep inside of us. It does not occur overnight. And he says there's no quick fix. It is crucial for us here to respect the slow work of God upon the soul. Slowly, ever so slowly, over days and weeks and months and years, the soul is being carefully formed and conformed and transformed through his holy work, his holy work, we are learning patience. We're learning to be still. We're learning perseverance. And we're learning, learning timefulness. And I just, you know, I'm often reminded um, that Jesus, when he was on earth, he never, like he it was never in a rush. Have you noticed that when you read about him? He walked everywhere. And he often would just stop for a meal and and hang out. He was never in a rush. And we live in a world that's rush, 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 go, 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 got to get it done. And Jesus just walked. And so we need to think about his life and how he did life because that is, he's such a, he's the example of us to understand how to allow the Father to work in our heart and our soul. So through this, this freeing process of growth, as we've already shared, we're, we are carrying on the daily tasks of home and work. And it's in the everyday, the everyday moments, the reality of our life. It's in these places that make up the central arena, the space where the work of formation happens. The work of formation happens in your everyday life as you are connecting to the heart of the Father and allowing Jesus to work in you. So Richard also shares that um, he's like, I'm not aware of aware of an exhaustive list of spiritual disciplines. So if you're looking for what all the things, <laughs> and believe me, each discipline is unique to also who you are. So he was saying, as far as he knows, there's no exhaustive list. And um, as we're learning um, to undertake these practices for the heart and for the mind and the soul, um, Again, they place us before God. So some practices, and it's going to be a bit based on your personality, some are formal and liturgical. And I love what Moira did this morning with the, with the response of reading in Scripture. It's more liturgical, and that's, there's beauty in that. And some practices are spontaneous and free-flowing. And I think about, again, worship can look like that too because you've got your flags and your dance. That's more free-flowing as just a, an example of something that there's differences right, in the way that we can respond to the Father. So the actual practices of disciplines are as varied and as creative as the human personality itself. And I just, I was like, yes, <laughs> I just love that. And, and this is also, I was, when I was reflecting on this, this is, I was thinking, I was like, this is why I love um, our community church, because uh, when it was founded, um, it, it was, it's been fed by seven streams of the church. Um, and the seven streams are orthodoxy, evangelical, charismatic, holiness, contemplative, Catholic, and social justice streams. We are fed by a variety of streams, and we recognize the beauty and the creativity of God working through his church through these different streams. And that's the same with disciplines. There is beauty in them all, and we need to be open to what God would have us step into that is going to allow us to be before him in a place that we can connect with him. So the key, um, the key to spiritual disciplines are actions, actions of the body and heart, mind and soul that we actually do. <laughs> so not just admire, not just study, not just hear about, not just debate, 
but practice, because we want to put ourselves before the Father. We need to practice these things. And so there's many of you here that have taken the Emotionally Healthy Relationship Discipleship courses. So a few other just terms that you might be familiar with. Rule of life is a spiritual practice. The daily office, which is stopping uh, two to three times a day to, to read scripture and be with the Father. Sabbath, taking a 24-hour time away from work um, and being open to what the Father is doing. Exploring the iceberg, the things in our hearts before the Father, what emotions are there. Climbing the ladder of integrity. So these are just some other practices and terms you may have heard of. So as I said, our practices have an enormous variety. One thing, however, will always be central to the exercise of spiritual disciplines. One thing is central, the Holy Scripture. That is central. Reading Scripture, studying Scripture, meditating on Scripture, memorizing Scripture. And if you remember back to the very beginning of the year, Colby and I talked about this. Get into your Word. Get into the Bible. Know the Scriptures. Come before the Father and ask Him to show you what He wants to teach you through His Word. And if we truly want to be like Jesus then we'll want to take up the overall way of life that Jesus lived when he walked amongst us as flesh. And so we read all about that in vibrant living reality in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we learn as we read through those Gospels that Jesus undertook spiritual disciplines as, fixed, as a fixed pattern of his life. Jesus did it. So should we. And, you know, when, I, when we read Scripture, it says that Jesus says, I only do what the Father is doing. He put himself before the Father daily. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. And it's not just Jesus. When you really start to look at Scripture, you'll discover that all the great ones in the Bible exercise a large variety of spiritual disciplines themselves. So surely, this is an incentive for us to follow the lead of those who are great examples through Scripture. And so as I was reflecting on spiritual disciplines and the meaning of that to give us time to come before the Father, I was thinking, okay, spiritual disciplines are participating in a practice that places us before God. It's a practice. And a life that includes spiritual disciplines is for us. It's for us ordinary people. So oftentimes people think spiritual disciplines, I need to go to a cave, I need to go to a retreat center, I need to go away. No. No. It's for us in the everyday living of life. It's for us in the ordinary washing the dishes doing the laundry, shoveling the snow, working with your children, doing your work, and the everyday stuff of life. That's where we can connect. That's where we're invited to connect. That's where we're invited to learn what God is speaking and what he's saying. So this is the life of following Jesus and participating in the healing journey that the Father has us on. So... In this past week, I have talked to a number of people who have, have shared with me. I'm so distracted. There are so many distractions. I don't know what I'm going to do. They're just, they're everywhere. <laughs> and I, there was just a number of conversations that actually stood out in my mind. And I found this very interesting because as I was preparing for this message, what do you think the biggest deterrent to putting ourselves in places to be with the Father is? Distractions, <laughs> exactly. Distractions. So in the live stream, <laughs> you type it in, distractions. Um, and then furthermore, in Richard Foster's book on the celebration of disciplines, he wrote that book 40 years ago. And it's still a huge seller, 40 years ago. And he's recently updated it. And it's fascinating because in his intro, he states this. He says, the major difference that has occurred in the past 40 years that does indeed impinge upon the spiritual life in one word is distractions. <laughs> exactly. So distraction is the primary problem in the contemporary culture. And he says, frankly, when we are perpetually distracted, we are unable to discern the voice 
of the Lord. So even, you know, and I was talking to Josh about this a little bit ago, even when we sit, because I like to read my Bible on my iPad, (laughs) and so when you sit and you're reading and then you get this like, ding, notifications come up, distractions, Um, and I just need to make a plan to turn those off so that when I'm reading in the morning, I'm not like, oh, what's that? Um, So, um, yeah, exactly, it's so true. So we need need time and we need practices and disciplines to help us position ourselves before the Father. We need to make that time. And so I just have a, I just want to end with a bit of a story about distractions. Um, So, and it's been, it's, for me, it's been a busy few weeks, and my schedule has become, the last couple weeks have been, has become quite challenging to manage. And so I've been trying to figure out, you know, what do I need to keep on my schedule? What do I need to remove from my schedule? What do I need to restrict so I can get things done without overworking? And it's very, it's very easy to overwork in this job, and really any job with people, I find. <laughs> and I've been in the people profession for a long time. And I was thinking, you know, well, maybe, maybe I need a professional coach or maybe, you know, something like that, like maybe a, some people to hold me accountable certain things. I don't know. So I was just processing, and I was like, I know it's good to admit I need some help. So, um, you know, I've been thinking about this and, men- you know, mentioning it to a few close friends, kind of processing, you know, thinking about it, thinking through it. And so Monday afternoon, I'm sitting, doing my work, and the phone rings. Another distraction. <laughs> And I look at my phone, uh, and it says, Hope, British Columbia. I was like, oh. (laughs) Well, if, you know, if I thought there was going to be a call to answer, why not answer a call from Hope, (laughs) right? (laughs) So it it turned out to be just the person I needed to talk to or speak with. And it's kind of like God knows, right? He knows (laughs) what we're ruminating on. He knows what we're navigating through, and he brings the right person the right time. So I shared my thoughts and I shared my challenges. And he reminded me, uh, and this was Steve Schroeder, for those of you who know Steve, he's a good friend with Josh and Aaron, and he had given me a call. Anyway, he knows, he reminded me that the first things, he said, first things first. He says, yeah, those are, you know, those are great things. But first, Tracy, just go to the Father. Just Bring your schedule to the Father and ask him for your perspective. Ask him for his perspective on your schedule. Ask him what he has to say about it. You don't have to figure it out on your own. And I was like, yeah. (laughs) I had gotten so distracted with everything going on around me that I just wasn't listening well. And I don't need to strive on my own. So Steve, he said, you know, he said, I invite you to try it this week. Bring your schedule before the Father and just seek his perspective first. So I was like, okay, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, God. (laughs) So the next day, I settled down before the Father with my journal, and we talked about my schedule, and he reminded me that, Tracy, yes, I will I will help you with your daily schedule. I will help you with your weekly schedule, your monthly schedule, your yearly schedule. Just come before me. And, you know, I knew this in my head because I've read it and I know it and I've done it before. But just the emotions and the anxiety of the last couple of weeks had just taken over. And I needed to settle myself, take some deep breaths before the Lord and really focus on listening. I needed the encouragement to do that as well. And as I did that, the Lord worked out my day. And so I made the list of things I knew I needed, the, prior, the priority things I needed to complete and I got it done. <laughs> I should say he helped me get it done. <laughs> I'm so excited. Um, and I did it for the rest of the week. And it was just so much better. So much better to do it with the Father, to do it with the Lord. Because he knows my limits better than I do. And he knows what's going on and what's going to happen in the week. Um, and I can look forward to, and I look forward to what he's going to teach me in the coming weeks as I come before him with my schedule. So we're going to give it time. We're going to give it time. God does not expect you to change yourself. He does not expect you to do it by your own knowledge, but we can get trapped in that, right? Or by your own strength 
or by your own wisdom. If that was possible, he wouldn't have had to die. So when it comes to giving it time, um, and I love how Henry Cloud says it, so I'm going to share this with you. So I really appreciate the way he puts it. He says, think about how much God believes in your inability. We judge ourselves because of our inability. I was judging myself. But he embraced the idea of our inability so deeply that he died for it. Now, what are we doing judging ourselves and anyone else when he died to stop the judgment? Such a good reminder. Jesus, he didn't die just to leave us where we are, stuck in our depression and anxious thoughts and so on, and, um, you know, even thinking about Celebrate Recovery, stuck in our habits and our hurts and our hang-ups. He doesn't, he didn't die just to leave us there. He died to begin the process of removing the judge that kills the growth. Jesus sanctifies us over time by bringing us the grace and truth that will heal what ails us. So he sanctifies us over time. So that's why, be kind to yourself. <laughs> it takes time and grace and truth. So there's, there's no quick fix. There's no quick fix. There's Jesus. Only Jesus. And in, in knowing that there's no quick fix, we can just sit there and say, Father, I need your grace. So here's what I want you to do. Got some homework for you. <laughs> so I want to I want to encourage you, I want to invite you to take the parable of the fig tree that we read today. And I want you to ask yourself, what are the ways in which I'm getting the grace, the truth, and the time that I need? So what are the practices? What are the actions? in which I'm getting the grace, the truth, and the time that I need. And consider, reflect back, sit with the Father, consider why healing or growth hasn't happened for you in the past. Maybe you had one of the elements, maybe you had two out of the three. And so I want to invite you this week, just like my call from Hope, British Columbia, to come before the Father each day, every day, this week, and ask him, Father, what do you want to say today? What do you want me to know today? And when you get distracted in that quiet moment with the Father, because you will, remember, don't beat yourself up. Remember that that distraction is just an opportunity to come back to the Father. And to say, Father, here I am. Here I am. He knows. He knows how fragile we are. He knows that we get distracted. So just return back to him and receive his kindness and his grace. Father, what do you have to say? What do you want me to know today? So allow that grace to be applied and give it time and allow the Father to dig for truth and to reveal that to your heart for that healing journey. It's one day at a time. It's one step at a time. Sometimes it's just one minute at a time. But he's in it. He wants to walk with you in it. He wants you to know that you're not alone. You're not alone. He's with you. Huh. <sighs> So with that, that comes to the end. Um, but yeah, I just really want to encourage you guys to do that. So before we, before we end today, I just want to just pray, just to pray for you um, and just to encourage you to do that. So let's, let's just pray together. Just open your hands um, just to receive. Father, Father, we just, we thank you, God, that you... Um, 
that you are always speaking, that you are always drawing, that you're such a good vine dresser. Um, you're always you're digging for truth and you're applying grace and you're giving us time, Father. You don't demand from us. It's day by day, week by week, the relationship back and forth, back and forth. And so, Father, I just pray this week uh, with this invitation to come before you and to listen and to ask and to seek, to seek you for our days, for our weeks. Father, I just pray that you would help each of us, God, just to, to be in reality, to come before you in the reality of what we're facing. And Lord, in this, even the uncomfortable moments of silence, Father, that you would just meet us in those. And Holy Spirit, would you remind us when we're distracted just to return and tell the Father, here I am. Just remind us of that, Father. And Lord, help us to breathe in your truth, even if it's, Lord, even if it's five minutes before you breathing in your truth, that's a start, and that gets us moving in the right direction. Help us to know that small beginnings, that you do not despise those. You do not despise small beginnings, because it all starts in a tiny seed anyway, a tiny cell, and then it grows because of what you provide and what you give just like a plant starting from that little seed. And the sun comes and the rains come and you fertilize and give, a, give the plant what it needs and it grows. Same with us. So Father, we do not despise small beginnings and we just, we thank you that you have died for that judge <laughs> that's often in our heads um, and that we often feel from others or we feel from ourselves and you've died for that judge and we just ask, God, that you would just silence that judge and that we could hear your voice so clearly. Thank you, God, that you are restoring and that you are transforming and that you are conforming us more into your image every day. Lord, I pray that you just would infuse us with your joy and your sticky love this week, knowing that you're not going anywhere, that you're right here with us, and that in your gentleness, you're guiding and you're correcting and you're helping us see who we are. So just bless each one this week, Father, as they come before you. Draw them in your perfect peace. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, thank you guys for being here. Thank you online. And just a reminder that next week, um, as long as there's no changes, we're at 50% capacity, which means like 200 people. Um, and we've got kids' church. And so, um, and so far, what I've heard too, we can sing. Yay, all the good things. So we're looking forward to that. Um, and yes, praise the Lord. We're going to be able to enjoy fellowshipping together and uh, being together. So amen and bless you as we go into the week. Amen.